Hello and welcome to the latest seminar from the Glasgow Centre for Population Health, supporting new approaches to improve health and tackle inequality. In this videocast, Cameron Parcell, Professor of Social Sciences at the University of Queensland, and Andrew Clark, Lecturer in Sociology and Social Policy at the University of New South Wales, explore the question, how can charity be reimagined to contribute towards a more just society? It was recorded via Zoom on the 6th of September, 2022. Uh, good morning, everyone. Welcome to this uh, GCPH uh, seminar. And a good evening to our friends from Australia who join us today to present. Uh, my name is James Egan. I'm a Public Health Programme Manager at the Glasgow Centre for Population Health. I just want to take a quick minute to give you some background to our thinking as to why we decided to organise today's uh, timely seminar. Um, since the centre was set up in 2004, we've developed, the centre's developed a range of uh, working relationships uh, with third se sector partners from housing regeneration, child poverty, transport and urban environment, green space and arts and health, to name but a few. In 2015, we commissioned a report looking at the change in nature of the work in Glasgow's third sector. Uh, that report is still available if people want to look at the, the report on the website and there's an accompanying blog. It's uh, quite uh, sad that some of the themes that emerge now are some of the things that we're still grappling with today, austerity welfare reforms and the change in nature of work. Um, I guess on a more personal note, uh, before returning to the NHS and working at the centre in 2010, I spent 10 years working in the voluntary sector. Uh, this included spells with the Scottish Refugee Council, and the Scottish Drugs Forum, uh, both social justice issues that are live and relevant right now in contemporary Scotland today. Um, fast forward into today, I want to just uh, just remind people, if they're not aware of it, that last month a group of charities, including one of the panel members today, wrote to the First Minister, the Scottish First Minister, urging that the cost of living crisis is treated as a top priority, requiring dramatic action to help those in the lowest incomes. Um, so I hope you do agree that today's seminar, looking at how charity might be reimagined to contribute towards a more just society is quite timely, a timely event. I just want to finish up now and hand over to today's chairperson, Professor Modag Trainer. Uh, Modag is a professor of child and family inequalities and the deputy director of the Institute for Social Policy, Housing, Equalities and Research, uh, also known as iSphere, at Heriot University. She's also the Deputy Chair of the Scottish Government's Statutory Poverty and Inequality Commission, and she works on poverty looking at measurement, causes, consequences, mitigation and prevention, with a particular focus on the impacts of poverty on children and families' outcomes. Um, she's forgot to mention the biography because she's too modest, but she's also the author of this excellent book, which I can highly recommend, called Child Poverty, aspiring to survive. Uh, so without any further ado, I'll pass you on to Modak, who's going to chair today's event. Thank you, and I hope you do enjoy it. Thank you very much, James, and thanks for that introduction. And thanks all for attending today and welcome. Um, this is the first lecture in the 19th seminar series for GCPH called How Can Charity Be Reimagined to Contribute Towards a More Just Society? Um, we can tweet about the webinar and it has a hashtag, which is hashtag GCPHSEM19, which I'm sure will be put in the chat. And the webinar is being recorded and the recording will be available after the event, along with a copy of the presentation slides on GCPH's website. Um, when the recording is available, the links will be emailed to attendees. So let me explain what the format is today. We will have a 45 minute presentation from um, our today's speakers, which is Professor Cameron Purcell and Dr. An Andrew Clark, which are very excited to join us from Australia, where I believe it's evening time. So thanks so much to Cameron and Andrew for joining us. Following that, we will have a panel question and response where they will be able to, our panel members will be able to respond to Cameron and Andrew from their perspective and ask a question. Our panelists very briefly today, I'll introduce them more fully later, are Tressa Burke from Glasgow's Disability Alliance, Peter Kelly from the Poverty Alliance, 
Debbie King from Shelter Scotland and Anna Fowley from SCVO. I will also be attempting to monitor the Q&A function and responding and taking some of the questions from the audience. You may have questions for Cameron and Andrew themselves, and I'd be happy to uh, share those. And you may also have questions for our panelists, and that's okay too. Um, I don't expect to be able to get through everyone's questions, unfortunately, because we have um, a good number of people on this call today, which is fantastic. Thank you for coming. And our time will probably be quite short at the end, but I'll do my best to get through the questions and at least represent um, what people are thinking. For now, I'm going to switch my camera. In, uh, camera in? No, I'm not. I'm going to switch my camera off and hand over to Cameron and Andrew. Thank you. Ah, thank you very much for the introduction, Morag, and welcome everyone. I'm very, very pleased to be here to, to present this evening here where I am in uh, the Blue Mountains of New South Wales, and I'm conscious that it's morning where you are now. I think Andrew's just popping the slides up now. Yeah, um, thanks for having us, everyone. Um, they should be up. Can everyone see the slides? Do you see them, Cameron? No. Oh. I can see uh, them. Yep. Yeah, I can see them. Sorry. I'm good now. That's right. Thank you very much. <laughs> today, today, we're going to try and do something that I that I think is, is somewhat complicated because what we're really talking about when we're looking at charitable responses to poverty, we're really asking questions about what does it actually mean to help someone who is living in poverty? What does it mean to help someone who's homeless? What does it mean to provide help that's helpful for someone who's experiencing profound deprivation? And of course, what we know is, and we'll discuss this in a little bit more depth later on, we know that there, people's profound deprivation, poverty, homelessness is produced by what the state doesn't do. So what can we do as citizens to try and respond to that through practices of charity? And a really a question that Andrew and I have been grappling with is, how can we be just when we soothe the consequences of poverty, but when our actions don't address the, uh, the fundamental causes of poverty or the fundamental needs that people have? And, and it's a tension because citizens are motivated to try and do what they can, what's within their reach to help people who are poor, yet they very, very often don't have the capacity to provide what people really need. So there's a complicated space in terms of what should we do, who gets determined, what is actual successful adequate help, and how can that help be even more optimistically conceived, particularly when we take the perspective of the person who's being helped, the recipient of that help. And I think that's going to be one of the key points that we try and make throughout um, the presentation today. Uh, next slide, please, Andrew. There's, there's been an awful lot written about the third sector, the not-for-profit sector, the charitable sector. What we're focused on principally today is the practice of charity or acts of charity. And what we mean by acts of charity, we're talking about individuals who are out there trying to do something themselves. And, and often this happens as individual citizens who may see someone in the public realm who they might try and help themselves as a practice of charity. But what we also know is that the practice of charity what individual citizens do to try and help others often also happens through charitable organizations. So we know it's not a, a, a completely clear cut distinction, but we're not focused on uh, not-for-profit organizations who are providing government funded services with professionals. We're, we're very much looking at um, charity as it was originally conceived. And charity, of course, has a uh, can involve the giving of resources, the giving of money, often the giving of food. We also know that the, the act of charity, the practice of charity is also about giving one's time. And I think giving one's time um, offers a really important opportunity um, to think about what, what else it can, um, can can consist of. Very often charity is thought about in a religious realm and some people define true charity as charity where the charitable are not interested in receiving any benefit at all. They're not interested in what the recipient of their charity can provide back. And that might sound morally appealing, but toward the end of the presentation, we're going to suggest that that focus on doing charitable care because it's right, because it's motivated by one's religion, and we're not interested in uh, the recipient of that charity providing anything back, can actually be a, a barrier to that kind of type of 
motivation to do good to actually realize good. We have to really think about how the recipient can be at front and center of, of what we're talking about when we're providing charity. And of course, determining whether that is decent care or not. Uh, next slide, please, Andrew. Many, many, many people know, and of course they know in the context of the, the, profound, the profound poverty and indeed the increasing rates of poverty uh, across uh, Scotland, broadly the United Kingdom, but also Europe, the United States, Australia, that actually there's a, been growing charity. Uh, there have been growing charitable organisations. There have been growing number of citizens who are volunteering in charities. And of course, there have been growing numbers of people who are poor who are relying on charity. And we know that they're relying on charity because the resources provided by the state, be that income support, um, be that other forms of care, and of course, fundamental structural needs like housing are actually not being met. And they're not being met for a, a range of reasons that we might call policy decisions. Um, many of the need, many of the growth, much of the growth in charity is really driven by some structural forces. Um, but nevertheless, even in countries like Finland that have a um, traditionally what was conceived of as a universal and comprehensive welfare state, the data is demonstrating that more charities are existing, more people are volunteering in charities and more people are becoming reliant on them, including Finnish citizens. Uh, next slide, please, Andrew. What's actually popping up an awful lot in Australia recently and elsewhere are these kind of bottom-up charities which are trying to respond to an immediate need and they're, and they're often not associated with the traditional religious organisations that have been the mainstay in Australia since colonisation of providing charity. They're kind of these innovative, innovative I use in scare quotes, modes of charity that are trying to provide basic amenity. And some of these include um, the provision of washing machines in the back of vans uh, that go out onto the streets and actually wash people's clothes who live on the streets. This idea became so famous in Australia that the inventors of this mobile washing machine service actually installed showers on the back of vans and they would drive around the streets and people can shower in the streets. What's also become very, very popular, although there are fewer, but ne ne nevertheless popular in Australia, is this idea of sleep buses. There are entrepreneurs, charitable entrepreneurs, who are renovating buses into mobile shelters and they're driving around the place. And these are these kind of ground up examples of charity that are happening in, in Australia. Uh, next slide, please, Andrew. Yeah, I just add, I like to think of these as kind of the startups of the charity sector. It's that same <laughs> kind of ethos. It's less necessarily religious and more inspired by this entrepreneurial kind of spirit. Yeah. That's right. And it's often thought in a sexy kind of way, like startups are. It and is. This is not yeah. actually a quirk. It's not a quirk to Australia. This organization is in the United States. They actually are not only providing mobile showers, so showers attached to vehicles that drive around the street and wash people who are poor. This is an organization that actually provides consulting services so other startups, if you will, can do the same. They're trying to spread the word of um, how others can engage in these new novel forms of charity that provide training, consultation, and even some um, uh, resources to start up people's own ground up initiatives. Uh, next slide, please, Andrew. Of course, this is not a quirk to um, Australia or the United States. We see this in the United Kingdom. I'm not sure if it's in Scotland, but certainly in, the, uh, in England, but also on the continent. Um, we see ideas of people always wanting to come up with designing new, constri new contraptions. In Australia, we, we try and convert buses so people can sleep in, but others are trying to do things like backpack beds or sleep suits, or even thinking about how wheelie bins or other kind of, uh, I can only describe as devices, can be remodeled <laughs> so that people can sleep in them. And you probably get a sense of what we're going to say about these things in a little while, but these are, these are kind of ideas, these are practices, ground up forms of charitable care that are happening in all of the rich countries that we can think about in Europe, the UK, uh, the United States, Canada, and Australia and New Zealand. Uh, next slide, please, Andrew. Now, it's very, very, very challenging providing uh, uh, a damning critique of these. We try to do it, but nevertheless, we're conscious that it's challenging. And it's challenging because often these forms of ground up charity couch what they do in terms of, well, everyone has a right to a shower. And when Cameron and Andrew challenged this, 
were responded to with, are you challenging someone's right to a shower? Well, they also talk about everyone deserves to be clean. You know, this is about dignity. And certainly one doesn't want to be on the, the side of advocating against dignity. It's also very, very obvious that these charities, charities that we offer some critiques about, are actually responding to a very, very clear form of deprivation. The reality is in all of those rich countries that I mentioned, there are people who are so poor, so excluded, so marginalized from our mainstream institutions that they are sleeping on the streets, that they are begging for food. There is a very, very, very clear need that these charities respond to. What we also know, and there may be some public health people or um, clinicians on the, on the Zoom, we know that actually poor hygiene, poor nutrition is really bad for our health. There are lots of reasons why the life expectancy of people who are homeless or people living in chronic poverty um, are shorter than uh, the rest of the population. But some of those are around nutrition, hygiene, and some of the, the poor health consequences that flow on from poor hygiene. So these charities are responding to an observable need and that need, if it's left unresponded to, has very, very negative consequences. So the stakes are high. Next slide, please, Andrew. Okay, this is not just a fringe movement. I know that um, my dear friends in Scotland love the monarchy as much as Australians do, but we had, the, had Prince Charles come out to um, Australia with his wife. Uh, let me get a title correct. I wouldn't want to get that wrong. The Duchess of Cornwall. And she toured Australia. And of course, when you come to Australia, you want to go out when you're the um, soon to be king of Australia. Let's um, park that for another seminar in terms of the righteousness of that. His wife went and saw this mobile laundry, the Orange Sky Laundry, and she was so impressed with it. She put her hand up to be the first volunteer if this kind of innovative, brilliant idea ever makes it to the UK. So impressed with this idea was the Duchess of Cornwall. So you might even see it out your way soon. Perhaps you already do. Uh, next slide, please, Andrew. But of course, it's not just royals, it's also seminal serious scholars who remind us that the actions of citizens who are motivated by nothing else than to help their fellow citizens is actually, without any doubt, a positive sign of an individual. And of course, a collective of people demonstrating this altruistic behavior is almost certainly a sign, we think, of a positive society. Richard Titmus spoke about the, you know, the willingness of people in the United Kingdom to, to give blood for free as opposed to selling plasma in the United States as a sign of a vibrant, connected, caring society. So we have to be conscious that going out there and trying to help others in sheer, overt, profound deprivation is a morally uh, desirable action, we can think. Next slide, please, Andrew. All right. Subsidiarity, there are also many, many people who argue that, you know, even if they might want to challenge the idea that people should be sleeping in rubbish bins or in backpacks or in sleep suits, the idea that poverty, homelessness, deprivation should be responded to from people on the ground has a very, very, very long heritage. Subsidiarity is something that's strongly advocated by many in the Catholic Church. In fact, the idea that a centralized state should be providing resources to distant citizens elsewhere is an impos imposition, some people would argue. Certainly that's an idea even outside of Catholicism, which is widely supported in the United States, that we don't want a central government coming in here and providing things. We actually want local people who know what the needs are responding to need that they see in front of them. So, so a lot of people see this as not just a a positive individual behavior, but it's actually a very, very important way to organize society. A point that I think Andrew will make is that when we're talking about charity and how we help, we're nearly always talking about what we think the ideal society is. Next society, please. Uh, next slide, please. <laughs> we're not up to the next next society, society, that'll be the last couple of slides. Okay, but some caution. <laughs> My very, very dear friend and um, uh, brilliant collaborator, Suzanne Fitzpatrick, Glasgow's own, She's reminded us, she would say, well, Cameron, we need to be a bit cautious with her brilliant research on the homelessness monitor in the UK or in England, I think. She looked at localism and, you know, localism draws on ideas of subsidiarity and that local communities are best positioned to respond to their own forms of harm. Well, her analysis with colleagues, Hal Pawson and others, 
demonstrated that localism actually was a means to put upward pressure on homelessness. You know, the, the disengagement from the central state to provide these fundamental resources, housing and income support is actually perhaps um, intuitively a really great way to increase housing injustice. We also have to be a little bit cautious because some people engaged in these bottom up forms of charity actually have a very, very um, problematic idea of people who are poor. They have a very paternalistic idea. They have a very, um, dare I say, unhelpful idea that assumes that people who are poor are deprived in individual or moral ways. And what charity is, is not just about giving someone a resource, but it's actually about trying to make them better people through emulating the, the middle-class volunteers, um, aspirations and values. So a lot of people are engaged in charity out of this idea that they need to go and uh, mold the, the poor into better citizens. And this is very, very controversial, of course, but nevertheless, this is one of the motivations um, that we see in this paper in particular from uh, research in a very, very posh suburb of London. Next slide, please, Andrew. Oops. Okay, so just, just bring it all together very, very quickly. What we know from a lot of research we've done all across Australia is that the reality is most people who we see providing charity are actually motivated to do good. I mean, there's, a, there's some nuances and complexities going on, but fundamentally they're trying to do good. There's also a clear need that they're trying to meet. And we absolutely know that if they don't meet that need, people's lives are going to be worse. This is where it gets complicated. And we know that people going out and trying to meet that need is probably something that we want to be excited about and tap into, but hopefully in a different way. But of course, being the recipient of charity is far from ideal and it perhaps is far from ideal in lots of societal ways. And I think I'm going to turn over to Andrew now, who's going to um, speak for the next perhaps 15 minutes or so. Thanks, Cameron. So I'm going to pick up um, um, from where Cameron left off and talk uh, a bit more specifically about our research into charity. And um, I'll be drawing in particular on our book um, that you can see on the screen here. It was published last year, um, where we try to engage with these various processes that Cameron has been talking about, this general resurgence of charity as a response to poverty, and also some of the different ways of thinking about charity, um, whether they be ideological justifications, religious motivations, um, and um, you know, other aspects um, um, of, of, of those processes that Cameron has brought to. Um, we, we try and engage with those in, uh, in, in, in a critical way, but a way that sort of isn't Glib or, or flippant that takes seriously some of those things that Cameron has foregrounded about and the, the scholars that he spoke about foregrounded about the values that are that, that are embedded and the value that is embedded in this desire to help, but also the dangers. So in the book, we pose a number of questions. Um, and in particular, and the one that I'll probably spend the most time talking about is we look at what is charity's role in contemporary societal responses to poverty? Um, we also look at how is charity understood and perceived by the multiplicity of actors that are engaged in it or related to it in some ways, from the state, political elites, to the media, um, to people who volunteer and engage in charity, to people who receive charity. We look at how it is experienced by people who are the recipients of charity, who rely on charity, and what consequences it has for their lives and their sense of self. And finally, uh, we look at how charity can be transformed to help end poverty. That's how we conclude the book and that's how we'll conclude the seminar today. So starting with this first point, and I'll just leave my um, image off the, um, the, the points here. Um, we speak quite a bit about charity's role in, um, in, in responding to poverty. And really what we try and do here is we try to situate charity within broader social structures and social processes. And, and, we, and, we, and I think the way we frame it is the book is that we don't look at charity as an isolated practice, rather we examine it in terms of its relationships to the state, the welfare state, and to poverty itself. 
and to those broader social structures that Cameron um, alluded to earlier, such as um, housing systems, housing markets, um, um, those various kinds of other things. Um, and one of the things that we argue um, is that uh, this resurgence of charity and the role that charity plays in contemporary forms of poverty relief, poverty alleviation, um, is, are inextricably related to changes that we've seen in welfare provision over the last several decades. Um, and we argue, and I'm gonna flesh these points out in a little bit more detail in a moment. We argue that welfare cuts or welfare retrenchment, these kind of welfare state restructuring processes um, create the conditions for charity, for this resurgence of charity um, by worsening poverty um, um, and, and, and creating or putting people in a position um, where they rely on charity. However, we don't stop. This is, and, and most of you will be aware of um, scholarship that points this out, or you would be aware of it from your own work in um, the sector, uh, in, in, in poverty relief or um, responses to poverty more broadly. So we try to go a little bit beyond this um, because we think that it's not quite the whole story. We say that not only does do changes to welfare um, and the welfare state create the conditions for charity, but governments and other powerful actors within society are actively involved in cultivating charity, um, not just because they want to save money um, by cutting welfare or, or, or whatever, but because they see charity as a sign of the good society and, and, uh, and um, in, in, in terms of good citizenship, right? What citizens in society should be doing. So we also show various ways that the government um, uh, provides material support to charity through funding, um, um, uh, tax breaks, those kind of things, uh, but also symbolic support through the valorization of charity, the celebration of it, uh, the normalization of it, um, um, putting it on a pedestal as uh, an ideal, a uh, uh, an ideal form of citizenship or a practice of citizenship that people should be engaged in. So. Um, our research is focused on Australia. Um, however, um, as Cameron alluded to earlier, the processes we're talking about um, could sort of be traced across the um, developed world. And I'm sure that as we go through, you'll be able to think of examples from your own contexts. But looking at Australia, looking at this first point um, about how um, transformations to welfare have created the conditions for research and charity and greater reliance on charity. One thing we highlight in the book is that um, the uh, completely inadequate levels at which unemployment benefits have uh, are paid in Australia uh, and the way that this leaves people who are reliant on um, this form of income support um, are unable to meet their own basic needs um, and which uh, helps to explain uh, a greater turn to and reliance upon charity. So in Australia, um, uh, unemployment benefits have, there was a complicated set of policy decisions made in the late 90s that have basically meant that uh, unemployment benefits haven't increased in real terms since the 1990s um, and that they have slipped further and further below the poverty line. Um, so people reliant on uh, that form of income support over time have become um, um, poorer and poorer. So we've seen we've seen an increase in poverty over that period. I think it's maybe around two and a half percent, I think, over the last couple of decades. Um, but we've seen a, a much greater increase in the depth of poverty. So uh, how poor people are relative to um, the standards of the society has increased. We've also seen over this period um, uh, a decrease in the supply of social housing relative to population and as a proportion uh, of all housing, again, related to decisions that were made in the 1990s that saw the end of routine federal government uh, financial support to state governments in, in Australia to um, sustain uh, investment in social housing at levels that kept up with population. So, Social housing is a proportion of all housing in Australia has gone down from a high point of, I think it was somewhere between six and 7% in the early 1990s down to about 4% now. And um, um, as some of you may be aware, uh, Australia is experiencing quite a significant housing crisis as are many other parts of the world. Uh, and this decrease or this underinvestment in social housing plays 
a key role. And these are really important conditions for the emergence of all of these homelessness charities that Cameron has um, pointed to. So in the context of this declining state support for um, 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 uh, people experiencing poverty, decline, these, these changes in welfare, uh, we've seen a, a, a rise in um, the provision of charity. Um, um, just one example that I drew out from the book um, here is uh, the use of food banks increased by 22% in Australia between 2018 and 2019 alone. Uh, and note, this is before the pandemic. That's quite a significant increase across one year. And going to my point about the depth of poverty and the way that this creates the conditions for a reliance for reliance on charity. We saw um, um, some research that I think, Cameron, you were involved in um, um, for the Department of Social Services found that, um, and this is something we discuss in detail in the book, that people that are reliant on emergency relief, which is um, uh, various you know, payments or in-kind um, um, donations that people who are experiencing a financial crisis can access from charities in Australia. Um, it's meant to be a crisis payment. It's meant to be one off. But what the research found is that 50% of people that use emergency relief use it three or more times in six months. So they're not using it one off. It's a, it's a kind of consistent thing that they rely on to get by. Oops. So that was that first point, right, about the way in which welfare transformations create the conditions for uh, research and charity uh, and increased reliance on charity. Uh, I want to turn now to the ways in which um, um, that charity is kind of drawn in or cultivated by the state and other actors. Excuse me. Um, and one way in which this is done is through direct material support. So the provision of grants and other sources of funding directly from the state using public money um, to charities. And our, um, our third author, who's sadly not with us tonight, um, uh, but who is the data whiz, Paco Perales, he um, put together this uh, graph you can see here, which looks at um, a percentage increase in revenue from government grants to charities that are, were classified as providing some kind of um, social service. And you can see that over a three year period, that increases significantly. So the amount of money governments are giving to, um, to charities is going up. Um, I wanted to also give a quick example of some of the ways in which this money is being spent, some of the schemes through which it is, it is coming through. Um, and one, I think particularly, um, um, illustrative example is uh, the Dignity First Fund, which was established by the state of Queensland, the Queensland government in um, 2016. And so this is basically a pool of money that um, um, is routinely uh, allocated to um, homelessness charities or charities that are, that are promising to provide um, uh, new and innovative ideas um, for addressing homelessness and promoting the dignity of people experiencing homelessness. So precisely those kinds of um, sort of charity startups that Cameron was talking about um, earlier on. Okay, so in addition to these forms of material support, we also see um, an effort to cultivate charity through um, what we call in the book symbolic or um, discursive uh, forms of support. Um, and one particularly pronounced example of this is um, the, um, I guess, provision of prestigious awards and accolades to people engaged in these kind of bottom-up charity activities. Um, and we've seen over the last few years um, a number of um, uh, homelessness charities, um, the, 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 the entrepreneurs that have have, have launched these charities um, to be given one of the um, uh, Australian of the Year awards. So these, these awards are a big deal in Australia. Um, every year on Australia Day, our national holiday um, and our national sort of day of celebration, um, there's a series of these awards given out 
There's the Australian of the Year, there's an Australian of the Year for each state, there's Young Australian of the Year, uh, et cetera. And that person is sort of held up as an exemplar. All those people are held up as an exemplar of what a good Australian, what a good citizen uh, looks like in our country today. And they sort of have a platform, particularly Australian of the Year, they have a platform for the duration of that coming year, um, um, you know, where media and government and people continuously refer to them. Um, um, to kind of campaign for their issue to progress whatever it is, whatever project it is that they have been nominated for. <clears throat> so we've seen this go to Orange Sky Laundry that Carmen spoke about earlier. Another group that are called Swags for the Homeless, um, who, who I think got the award earlier, uh, five or six years ago for this backpack beds initiative they did. Uh, another lady um, uh, whose name I've forgotten, um, who's started a number of initiatives for the homeless. She was formerly homeless herself. One is a charity shop, which you can see there, where uh, uh, homeless women can come and work uh, to earn a bit of money and there's no sort of roster, so they can just come in when they want. She started another project called the Period Project, which was about um, um, providing uh, feminine sanitary products to women experiencing homelessness. I think she was young. Uh, no, she was Victorian Australian of the Year um, last year. So these, this is another way in which charity is cultivated. Um, and it's often coupled with um, uh, quite strong symbolic support from um, political elites or our, our political class. So, um, and, 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 you know, this can come on the back of uh, the provision of these awards or it can happen separately. But um, I just wanted to provide the example of when Orange Sky Laundry was provided, uh, was, was uh, awarded Young Australians of the Year, our former Prime Minister, Prime Minister at the time, Malcolm Turnbull, described them as, uh, described their initiative as practical and innovative, um, that it would go a long way to raising the health standards and restoring dignity to people experiencing homelessness. And the Premier of Queensland, the state where Orange Sky began and where the Dignity First Fund was set up, she said, um, their accomplishments are truly inspiring. They demonstrate not only amazing, amazing initiative and integrity, but determination to go above and beyond and make a difference. So you can see these themes coming through. We're also no, seeing- I just there, Andrew, that this is on the political yes, left and the political right of Australia too. Yeah, 100%, and across levels of government. So it's sort of bipartisan and at different levels of government. Yeah, thank you, that's a really good point. Um, I'm sort of laboring the point here. We also see this kind of symbolic support uh, amplified or engaged in by the media. Orange Sky described in the media as amazing, ambitious. There's uh, another charity here who provides blow-up mattresses in um, car parks overnight when they're not being used. Um, I had one media um, company in Australia questioning why no one's done it before. It's such a great idea, um, et cetera. So in the book, we try to engage in, uh, uh, well, we think a lot about how do we interpret this, right? How do we make sense um, of the of, of this of the relation of, of these processes that I'm talking about, right? The role of charity uh, in, in in society in poverty relief, the way it's kind of cultivated. Well, we say that it's as I said earlier, we we, we recognise that it's partly about reducing welfare costs by shifting responsibility to civil society. And as you'll see, I've put up some references for a number of other scholars have made this point, and and we would certainly see this as the case in Australia. <clears throat> However, we think the picture is a little more complex, not least because um, as the state has withdrawn funding from you know, top-down government welfare support, we also see it providing increasing amounts of money, public funding to charities. So it's not just about the money here. <clears throat> and we argue that um, what we're seeing also reflects changing citizenship ideals. Um, it's about what we as a society, and particularly our political class and our media class, um, um, consider to be a good citizen and a good society, what that looks like, um, um, and, that's, and, 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 and therefore engaging in efforts to cultivate and promote citizens and a society that reflect that ideal. And to make sense of this, we draw on the work of the sociologist, uh, British sociologist, Nicholas Rose, um, and his idea of ethical citizenship. And we argue that the charity is about cultivating a distinct form of citizenship that matches um, his idea of the ethical citizen. So Rose argues that um, 
um, from the end of the 20th century, we saw a kind of shift in the way that citizenship is talked about in political discourse. And this really entailed a move away from, um, you know, a preoccupation with social rights, um, that is people's right to social protection, particularly from the vagaries of uh, uh, capitalist societies, things like unemployment, sickness, old age, et cetera. Those things that kind of dominated post-war politics uh, in the developed world, and that was certainly the case in the UK and here in Australia. So Rose says that these things have kind of attenuated as um, um, core concerns and have been kind of displaced by this focus on the kind of ethical duties or the ethical virtues that citizens have or should have. Um, and, and politics has reorganized itself on trying to cultivate those, shape those, instill them in citizens. So in this era of ethical citizenship, the good citizen is conceived as someone who takes responsibility for the social problems that they see around them, that the homelessness they see on the street, um, the, the, the hunger that they, that they encounter, um, those kind of things. And they do this by um, um, uh, mo mobilizing bottom-up responses within their community. Um, they act on the basis of spontaneous compassion and compare these kind of ethical virtues, right? That, um, that, that many of us across the political spectrum think that modern societies are lacking. And importantly, um, they do this um, uh, without waiting for government to do it for them, right? So it's this real bottom up, get in there, DIY, um, you know, startup y kind of culture, but in a, in a kind of um, in, in the charitable, charitable domain. And a really, um, powerful example of this that we talk about in the book or an articulation of this idea um, came from our former recently departed Prime Minister, um, uh, Scott Morrison, who when reflecting on the Australian character and what makes a true Australian said that we are someone who make a contribution rather than take one. So this slide's probably a bit redundant because I think I've sort of set these points and we're running out of time, but really charity is taken um, as uh, by those who are keen to cultivate charity, to promote it, to create the conditions for it um, as exemplary of um, ethical citizenship um, uh, because it embodies this kind of spontaneous care, practical ingenuity, and it's a reflection of a society uh, or, or it's a reflection of responsible and resilient individuals in communities, right? Those kind of things that under ethical citizenship or the ideology of ethical citizenship we see as desirable. However, and so we develop a bit of a, a critique of uh, ethical citizenship generally, but particularly the, the, the forms of charity that are promoted and the way in which charity is treated and what charity means in the context of this particular um, um, you know, ideological setting, ideological context, you could say. And one of the points that we, we, we draw out is that ethical, citizen, ethical citizenship really puts the focus on the giver, right? The person who uh, is doing the charity um, and what their, what their acts uh, mean for them, both themselves as individuals, uh, as citizens and for um, as a society. So, Ethical citizenship and the, the ways in which it's cultivated celebrate givers' compassion and ingenuity. Um, um, charity is promoted, I'm sort of repeating myself now, <laughs> cultivating responsible and resilient communities. And but the most important point is by putting the giver at the center, uh, the consequences that charity has for people experiencing poverty is largely overlooked, right? So we focus on what it means for them, what it means for society, but what how is it experienced by those on the receiving end, those who rely on it, and what kind of outcomes does it produce? Does it actually reduce poverty or address poverty? Those kind of questions are largely overlooked. Um, Cameron, would you like to um, jump in for the next bit? Or sure, will. Thanks, Andrew. I, I know our clock's ticking, so I'll, I'll, I'll go rather mm. quickly. And, and and before we outline what we what we think. Uh, some of the ways we can reimagine charity, we have to take seriously what the experience of receiving charity is. In fact, we argue that the only way we can reimagine charity is by taking seriously these experiences of people who are reliant upon it. And the reality is that people express shame, they express um, 
a feeling of using charity as an absolute act of last resort of deprivation, which exacerbates their feelings of exclusion and participation in the mainstream society. And they are very, very, very clear. They may be profoundly poor and often living on the street, but they know why they're going to charity. And that is because they can't access housing that's affordable and they don't have a livable income as unemployed. Next slide, please, Andrew. I think this is a really important quote here at the bottom. This is a, a woman that we did research within a, a, a regional town in Australia. And she goes, of course, it's going to be humiliating um, going and accessing charity, going and ask a volunteer for food. But she says, the alternative is my kids don't get to eat. So it doesn't matter, she explained to us. And we were very, very lucky that charitable providers let us sit in on the interactions between the volunteers and the provider. And when we're sitting in, we could see that clear shame, but people going, well, not feeding my kids is worse than this shame that I'm experiencing now, so I'm gonna come in and do it. Next slide, please, Andrew. It's, it's always interesting when you're an academic to write an article for the newspaper because you, you, you soon learn that people read what you write. And it was interesting, I wrote an article for a kind of a centrist newspaper called the Sydney Morning Herald, which is a, has a very large readership. And I essentially said, we have lots of evidence about how to end rough sleeping. We know what the policy levers are. We know what the practices that are required. We also know the housing outcomes that will be achieved. We know the cost offsets. We absolutely need to invest in interventions to end rough sleeping and get people into housing. We need to stop investing directly and indirectly in charitable models of care that Andrew's discussed. I received an absolute avalanche of backlash, backlash against the assertion that we should be providing affordable housing with link support. People absolutely attacked me. Some even wrote letters, which was interesting. Lots posted online comments, lots emailed me. And there were lots and lots of um, dimensions to the hate mail I received and I analyzed them. But one I think is telling and it goes to the heart of what Andrew was saying. And this is one of the comments that I received. So really I understand your concern about Orange Sky Laundry of offering too many services, which are really only a Band-Aid and also serve to make people more comfortable. But I think their great gift is to attract a generation of young people to the experience, to experiencing the joy of giving and generosity of service to others. This gets to the heart of what many of these charities are about. It's about the giver. And this is really, really disturbing when I'm advocating for housing that's affordable as opposed to charity. And the response is, if we got rid of the charity, what are the opportunities for the middle class to exercise their care? Next um, slide, please, Andrew. And when we're advocating to get rid of charity, we're suggesting that actually we know what we need to do. We know what the knowledge is. This is not a knowledge gap. This is a political will gap. We know that if we provide housing that's affordable, and I'm conscious that in Scotland, there's a very ambitious plan for social housing to 2020 to 2030. We know that if we provide people with a livable income, they won't go and access charity so they can eat or sleep and or wash themselves on the streets. The pandemic was a an extraordinary example where we could actually measure exactly that. And again, we got all of the data of the two largest charities in one state of, a, of Australia. And we accessed when people went to the charity in the two years leading up to the pandemic to see what the, um, the cycle is throughout the years. In Australia, the government intervened in a, in a very Ken Keynesian kind of way during the pandemic where we provided Corona supplements, $550, $250 and $150. And also economic stimulus packages of $750 and then they went down to $250. When the government provided people who were unemployed, and that's these lines and shaded columns, completely intuitively, but we empirically substantiated it. When people were provided with a livable unemployment benefit that lifted them above the poverty line, the demand for charity, the actual demand measurably fell through the floor and the fall almost perfectly mirrored the increase, the level of increase in the rate of unemployment benefit. When the benefits, the increased benefits started to taper off back to their normal level, the rate of requesting charity started to increase in line with it. It was almost in a perfect example of showing exactly what might happen in terms of what charities would need to do or not 
if the government provided that fundamental resource. And I think this is really important and it's really important for reimagining charity. Next slide, please, Andrew. And we wanna, we wanna reimagine charity in, in kind of two ways. One is we know that citizens are always gonna be in need. It doesn't matter what the society looks like, there's always gonna be a need to provide the practice of charity. So we think that that could be okay, but we think it could be okay under conditions where we take the experience, the reality, the perspectives of the recipient of charity at the core. As Joan Tronto says, we can only determine the efficacy of care by asking the recipient what it's like to be cared for, not the carer. So we really have to take the person who's in poverty's experience at the forefront. Next slide, please, Andrew. Oops, hold on. There we go. And when we take the recipient of charity and their experiences as core, we can reimagine charity that thinks about how do I want to receive charity? Well, they, they don't want to feel shame, of course. And in some ways, they don't feel shame or their shame would certainly be minimized when charity isn't an exercise of the benevolent looking down to and giving someone who's poor something they don't have. It's actually about a mode of providing care where people can be both recipients and providers of charity. We were gonna think about how can charity be uh, uh, delivered through forms of reciprocity. And this is not reciprocity in terms of I've given you something you need to give me something. Rather, it's about how can we can create an environment where people are not just recipients. When we talk to people receiving charity and they talk about shame, they talk about the shame as a product of only receiving and never being able to give. They also talk about to get charity, they need to go and articulate their problems. They need to demonstrate how needy they are. And they feel that this is further and alienating. How can charity be provided in a context where people are not othered, where they're not seen as the embodiment of their deprivation? How can we provide this care in a more humane uh, manner where people are much more active agents in ensuring that they can respond to their immediate needs. Next slide, please, Andrew. We need to also reimagine what helping someone who is poor is. And of course, to help someone who is poor, charity needs to end poverty. There's no reason why charity can't be about actually working toward the redesign of society so poverty is not present. There's no reason that charity can't be about advocacy for structural change. There's no reason that charity can't be about the kind of the political work that's required to bring about change. And of course, people in charities, particularly those volunteering on the ground, have this great position in Australian society, as Andrew said. They have this capacity to have a voice. And they also have leg legit legitimacy when they're on the ground with people who are poor. But of course, it's people who are poor need to be provided the opportunities where they can advocate for the structural change themselves. And this is the kind of the reimagining of what helping someone in, in poverty is. It's helping someone to end their poverty. And that is through the societal change that's required. We saw that for a brief period in Australia when COVID happened, rates of poverty and thus rates of requesting charity massively reduced. Next slide, please, Andrew, because I know we're running out a couple of minutes before we go to the questions, which I'm super keen for. Of course, this idea that charity should be about doing things that the state doesn't want to do, this idea that charity should be about pushing the state to do things, this idea that charity should be at the forefront of advocating for structural change is not just about some kind of modestly radical social scientist from Australia. Lord Beveridge, the guy who was fundamental in the British welfare state, said that this is actually what charity should be about. Unfortunately, however, the, the previous Australian government introduced three bills to Parliament, which tried to do exactly the opposite. It was called um, um, colloquially as a silencing charity bill, where they wanted to have the capacity, the Commonwealth Government, to deregister charities if they engaged in a certain types of behaviours that would be tantamount to political advocacy. So the government were actively working to ensure that charity only did what Andrew suggested they should do, that is be the ethical citizens responding to the consequences of poverty. If charities were going to get out there and be too radical, the government wanted to legislate to deregister them, which would of course mean they'd lose their um, tax uh, status. Next slide, please, Andrew. Okay, and for a the last comment, I think it's good to go to, I think it was Archbishop Camara. When I give food to the poor, they call me a saint. 
when I ask why they're poor, they call me a communist. And I think this is about the idea of, you know, to really help people. And he was arguing to really help people in his in terms of his interpretation of the gospel, we need to be doing something. And of course, liberation theology is all about not only advocating for structural change, not only ensuring that people who are marginalized are there advocating, but they would argue from a Christian lens that the kind of structural injustices that charity responds to are impossible to create the conditions that actually would be pleasing to their kind of notion of faith. So actually they argue that the radical kind of change to end poverty is actually consistent with what the Christian idea of charity is all about. Thank you very much. And I think I'll, I'll hand over to my colleagues in the panel now.